Here we are, Tom Smith, another edition of Mortgages and BS with yours truly, BT, and Tom on the Alive and Social Network. How are you, brother? I'm doing great, man. This is a gorgeous day. This is, this is one of those days in Minnesota you just wait for, isn't it? I know, and that's why I got the window open here on the Alive and Social Network room, our little studio room. So if we hear a loud Harley Davidson or some kind of city equipment rolling by on 35th Street, we're, we're doing just fine. Hopefully we don't hear the sirens coming to get us up. No, exactly. And that's not an uncommon thing. I'm glad you brought that up. That could happen at any moment, given the way that we've rolled uh, in the past and potentially could roll at any moment. Well, they'd probably be looking for Mahoney, but... Yeah, exactly. Point well taken, Tom. Point well taken. Uh, You looped into us uh, a very special guest as we get the show underway here. This is fun. Set this up for us a little bit, my friend. Well, I had the fortinuity, I guess that might be a word, of (laughs) of, of meeting a person about 15 years ago uh, through through a mutual friend of ours. And we've become pretty good friends. And actually, the guy worked for me for a while, and it was Gopher quarterback Ricky Foggy. How are you, Ricky? Hey, I'm doing pretty good, and uh, um, thanks, you guys, for having me on this afternoon. What do you think about that word, the fortinuity? The fortinuity. Does that work for you? Kind of some time, man. It works for me. (laughs) (laughs) Here's one of the funniest (laughs) things is I always knew when Ricky wanted something, because instead of coming saying, hey, Tom, be Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, and, yeah. I, and I knew it, I knew I knew he was coming at me with something. So I like the fact I'm hearing Tom and not Mr. Smith right now. <laughs> that makes sense, you know. Anytime you're going to the boss. How long did you guys work together then, Tom? Uh, what, about three, four years, Rick. Yeah, I think it was four years we was together. Rick would uh, Rick would work uh, say about seven months out of the year. Then he'd go play arena ball for three or four. Got it. And after the second year, he promised me he wasn't going to do it anymore. Of course, he lied. And then I think one year, actually, you were off coaching for it, weren't you? Yeah, that's correct. I finally, uh, they made me retire at the right old age of 38. Jeez. And I was still trying to play. So they didn't let me play, so I got right into coaching. Ricky, how long, you played Canadian football for how long before the arena thing happened for you? Was that, uh, that was a pretty good stretch at the CFL, wasn't it? It was. Um, I got 10 years in the CFL, the Canadian Football League. And then I got eight years in the arena football. So um, I'm pretty lucky. My body's still holding together. I should say you're you're pretty. You should say you're pretty lucky, coach, because you're still in the game. That's true. Uh, you know, I think sports uh, has been a part of my life all of my life. But like I always tell, you know, the kids that I'm coaching or training is that, you know, sports don't define who you are. It kind of gives you a different a different outlook on life through sports because it's competitive and uh you know you got your ups and downs and the reason why why i chose to get into high school coaching is because you know somebody seen something in me um years ago that that made me believe in myself and um, gave me uh, the self-confidence that i could be uh successful in sports and i want to be in that position to you know give back to the community and help young kids out in that same way. I, I was kind of surprised Ricky ended up sticking around with coaching football because <clears throat> Rick is also a very avid basketball player. Okay. I mean, he's darn good. And Rick, when he was working with me, he was working with some local kids. And Rick wasn't one of the guys that uh, the U didn't want it and he ended up going to Wisconsin? Yeah, that was uh, Cameron Taylor. Ashley grew up in the, uh, the neighborhood I was living in at that time over North Minneapolis and Cameron uh with a point guard for uh, North High Polar Bears. And uh yeah, he went down and actually started two out of his three two out of four years for Bo Ryan down at the University of Wisconsin and uh, he was he had a pretty good career down there. I had a little small part to play now. You know, I used to take him in the backyard and whip him up every now and then. Hey, Ricky, when you were in high school in South Carolina then, before Lou Holtz brought you here for the Gopher team, was was basketball maybe one of the options, or were you just more of a football guy, you know, in your heart and soul? No, no. I was actually, baseball was uh, wow. in my heart and soul. Wow. Uh, yeah, I played. See, uh, a lot of people don't realize I was the baby of nine kids. And so, you know, growing up back in the 60s and 70s, you know, my parents, both of my parents had to work. So uh, we couldn't be left at home alone. So um, me being the youngest of the nine, um, I was either have to, you know, once I got of age, I had to play sports, stay with my grandma or my mom go, you can stay home, grandma, and watch soap office, or I can throw you in these sports activities at the YMCA. And I go, I had my fair share of soap office, so let's play some sports. <laughs> you know, I don't even think so, I knew uh, that about the baseball. 
<laughs> can't imagine. Yeah, so <laughs> once I got to once I got into high school, I actually played four sports. I played basketball, baseball, ran track, and also played football. Little Ricky watching General Hospital there. I just now that now I that's just an try, image. I'm trying to envision that one right now, Rick. <laughs> that's funny. No, that's man, funny. it was it was young and the restless. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the Y and R with Grandma. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh yeah, Victor. Uh, <laughs> Well, you had an outstanding run with uh, with those four years in the mid '80s at the U of M. That's for sure. Uh, and and playing for Coach Holtz, uh, a pretty cool experience there. What was he like? Oh yeah, that was awesome. Um, I just think that uh, what happened for us is that you know Coach Holtz got the job at the right time. You know, and by oh. state, I got recruited uh, by Coach Holtz at the right time because the university um, at that time, um, '82, '83 was was not good years for him. And so I think with Coach Holt's enthusiasm, I think with this type of offense that he ran, um, run the option, and that was exactly the same thing I did in high school. So I adapted to it right away. And so I just think that that excitement from him um, and that we was able to be competitive in, in some Big Ten games and some non-conference games against, you know, like Oklahoma, um, actually beat us 13-7 when they was number one. And so I just think that that whole era that – Lou was only here for two years, but he sparked an uh, excitement in, in the Twin Cities and at the University of Minnesota that they hadn't had for a while. Yeah, absolutely. And so it was just a rush, you know, being able to be a part of that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I can remember myself. I mean, you know, you know I'm a Wisconsin guy, and, and I can remember the Badger Gopher games, and I, all my buddies were from the Minnesota side. And, of course, uh, back then, Minnesota was still able to beat Wisconsin on a fairly regular basis. So I always ha- heard about you and uh, our friend Daryl. And of course, Daryl was here a couple weeks ago, and Daryl told me he made you look good. <laughs> <laughs> you were a senior when he was a freshman, well, right, Rick? Yeah, well, actually, I got two years with Daryl. Okay. Daryl came in uh, my junior year okay. uh, when he was when he was a freshman. Got it. And to be honest, he <laughs> he definitely took a, a big load um, off of me um, by running that option because I mean, this guy came in and he was a freak of nature um, as a running back and. You know, the first day we seen it, we thought it was a linebacker for sure. And uh, they go, no, this is going to be your starting running back. <laughs> running I go, back. hey, it works for me. Uh, but, but no, Darrell was a great fit. I mean, the, the kid came in, he was a you know, Big Ten freshman of the year and um, was able to go over 1,000 yards. And he was just in a, a joy to play with the two years I got with him. And, you know, and lo and behold, uh, me and Darrell are still best friends to this day. And if you ask him, I'm – if you I didn't pitch him the ball enough. That's for sure. <laughs> Actually, I think I think a couple times you guys, you, you and I, and uh, Daryl went out for beers. I probably heard that too. But uh, it is amazing. I mean, you you and him are still good friends, and that's actually how you and I met was through Daryl. Was when you were trying to wind, yeah. you were starting to wind down. You were looking for something different to do, and uh, you came over to the old company. Uh, it was that in 03, 04, probably when you came over to Optimum, and uh, you knew everybody. It was easy for you to shake hands and kiss babies and get business. Yeah, and that's the thing. Uh, that was one thing that Coach Holtz actually sold to us um, as he brought a lot of guys in my recruiting class. We came came from the South. And he, the one thing his selling point was that, you know, if you come uh, to the University of Minnesota, you can play football for four years, get your education. But it's such a great community and, and great state to live in. You're, I can pretty much guarantee you stay here living for 40 years. And it's pretty much true. The only thing he forgot to tell us that he was only he was only going to stay for two, and then leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I still find it amazing. I mean, because you are. I mean, you're from South Carolina. I know you go home a lot. You just go back to Dad's barbershop and stuff like that. I always try to figure out why you stayed here and hung here. But it is because of guys like Daryl. I mean, because you've got some good roots here, and I think that's one thing about the mm-hmm. University of Minnesota. I mean, the people that go there. Um, the roots that they form here are relationships that last forever. And and, and I know you've done that with a lot of guys. Yeah, and that's another thing that I try to instill in, in my players. Um, there's one thing that sports sports has actually allowed me uh, to form a whole new family. You know, if I hadn't gotten a scholarship to play football, you know, no matter where it would have been, I wouldn't have been able to meet all this new group of friends that I have. You know, like a Daryl Thompson and a Ray Hitchcock and a Chip Low Miller. You know, I can call these guys on any given time and chit chat with them about the old times and just see how their kids are doing, how their families are doing. And, and it takes us back to like, just like it was, you know, uh, yesterday being in school. But, uh, 
Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, you can all, I can always go back home and visit, but I think now uh, my core friends and uh, uh, football family is in the state of Minnesota, and uh, that's pretty much the main reason uh, while I'm still here, if uh, the winters wasn't so bad, it would be perfect. Yeah, it you would know. be, wouldn't now, it? Now, how, how's the gig going? I, I don't know how many people know. I mean, you're head coach now down in Red Wing. Uh, this was your first year last year, right? I think yep. it was kind of a rebuilding project. Tell me a little bit about that, man. How, was that a lot of fun for you? It is a lot of fun. That small community down there is, is pretty good. I like it because it kind of reminds me of home. Um, you know, um, I envisioned Friday nights. When I was in high school, everybody was at the football game. There was no stores open. Everything was shut down except for my dad's barbershop. He refused to close no matter what. Um, and so that's the kind of atmosphere I'm trying to bring down the Red Wing. And um, the previous three years before I got there, I think they, have, they hadn't won a game. And then um, last year we ended up winning two regular season games, uh, won the first round of the playoffs. And then we also got a kid named Nick Conley, uh, received a full ride from the Gophers. Nice. So there's some t- yeah, there's some talent down there. It's just the fact that, you know, like anything else, you got to have a plan um, and you got to make the kids work hard. But you always got to give them something to believe in and then look forward to. And so that's my whole ideal. And at the end of the day, um, I like to let the kids have fun and make an exciting them. And hopefully that'll make them, you know, the younger kids want to come out and, and be a part of our program. You're kind of a kid yourself, though, still, too, Rick. I am, man. I just can't get it out of them. You know, I'm, I'll be 49 in July, but Ouch. it still seems like I'm 19. But, uh, you know, I think that I get that from my dad. My dad is 77. He still cuts hair six days a week and nice. don't let anything really bother him. And, um, and he, he, he enjoys his life. And he told me, uh, you know, I think a couple of weeks ago I was talking to him. He goes, I asked him how he was doing. He goes, I'm doing pretty good. He goes, at this stage of life, I'm you know, kind of over of trying to do something to screw it up. I'm just in relax mode now and just riding it out. So, and I think this is the way uh, my parents raised us is to, you know, treat people right, do the right thing and, and have fun in life. Dad's got an interesting perspective on relax more working six days a week there, Ricky. He's a barber, man. All his friends come down there yeah. and they get their haircuts two or three times a week. They only go down there to hang out with him and tell all those barber stories. <laughs> yeah. I, when, when, when Rick used to come in and talk to me, I, was, I used to like try to picture, you know, Floyd the barber in Mayberry. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. Hello, Andy. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Except, except I, I, I got the feeling his dad was just a little bit more intelligent than Floyd. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, I, I look at Rick. Oh, I, look, yeah. I look at Rick, and I mean, Rick would tell me the stories. But, you know, it is, like you said, it's small town. That's how you see it, and especially in the old days. That's yeah. where the barbershop was. Oh, it's the hanging out spot, especially for the guys. Yeah, yeah and, you're, and there's still yeah, areas exactly. like that. I mean, it's, it's a place where you'll talk, watch sports, watch, talk shit, I guess you, you can say. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. And catch up on the local gossip. Mm-hmm. Like Ricky just said, you know, two, no three doubt. times a week, getting cuts two, three times a week. Don't even need the cut. You're just going in to socialize and have some time together. Get your ears cleaned. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Ricky, congrats on the on the rebuilding on the Red Wing High School team. You know, a couple wins uh, under your belt. And then that Nick Conley story, that's really sweet. You know, have one of the, have one of the boys uh, win a scholarship like that and get the uh, get the four-year ride. That's good stuff. You know, you mentioned the football world and and – staying in touch with people, and staying in Minnesota for a lot of the relationships there. When it goes back to the mortgage time that you spent with Tom, i, I got to imagine you cross paths with some of those customers from, from over the you know the time that you were working there too, right? Oh, yeah, there's no question. And I think mm-hmm. uh, the one thing that, uh, that helped me get business when I was there uh, with Tom is that, you know, they recognize the name. And, and that's what I, you know, I tell the kids. And I, that's why sometimes I get... Um, I'm dumbfounded about why athletes do such dumb stuff uh, to get themselves in trouble with the public, you know, get themselves in trouble with the media. And so that's why I told kids, I said, people remember me for one, you know, I played with Coach Holtz and we made a, a, a drastic change at the University of Minnesota. I go for two, I ain't really, I don't do anything wrong to get myself in trouble, you know. And you just keep your name clean, people will remember you, uh, people will still, you know, want to hang around you and, and uh, when I was in the mortgage business, I think people wanted to give me a shot to see how, how I would do just for the fact that I was a quarterback at the University of Minnesota. And then, uh, you know, of course, Tom came too from at the end. Nice. Well, and I think a big thing there is, you know, going back to like talking about the football thing is, is you get a work ethic when you play sports. I mean, and you can get that in a lot of different things, but coming out of the U playing D1 ball, 
he had a work ethic. And I remember when Daryl called me up about it, you know, he goes, oh, do you want a jack? And I'm going, shit, you know, I'm thinking to myself, a quarterback. Quarterback's got to be fairly smart behind there. You're playing D1 ball. You're, you're disciplined, all that kind of stuff. Heck yeah. And uh, took Rick a little while to figure it out. But, I mean, he, he did just fine. Um, I miss hanging out in the office with him, actually. You know? I bet. I bet. And, and you know, <laughs> reciting things from Forrest Gump, like, Jenne or something like that. <laughs> Who who won the matches when there was uh, when there was rolled up paper ball basketball going on in the waste can? Uh, a Ricky pretty much now. Well, Rick that? would yeah. yeah. I think if there was anything athletic in any slight yeah. way going on in the office, Rick would have won. <laughs> and if he wouldn't, yeah, we, probably, we, we, we probably would have let him win. And now he's got this new sport. He's got this new sport that I'm just amazed at. If, if you if you ever watch him on Facebook, every day he's at a different golf course. So I'm thinking he's going to go pro or something now. Oh, I wish I was that good, but you know, you always have to find, uh, you know, after you get out of football, you know, that you're still a competitive person. So, so I'm coaching high school football. I can't still just go out there and participate, which I, I do sometimes and try to send away the kids, try to get me out of there as quick as possible. But you always got to find another uh, sport that you can be competitive at, and, and that's golf. You know, I said it. You know, being a pretty decent athlete that I could conquer that sport and with, you know, flying colors. But that is totally not a a big deal. Uh, Golf is a a tough sport. It can beat you down on any day. Uh, But I'm going to keep at it, and maybe one day I can make the seniors to it. Well, all I know is whenever I see you, you've got a smile on your face. So the round has to be fairly decent because I know if you were taking pictures of me on a golf course, I would not be smiling. (laughs) <laughs> and you've seen me golf, so you know. <laughs> Middle name That's Scowl. My personality. I like to smile a lot. I, I, I'm a landscaper. I take out a lot of grass. <laughs> <laughs> Sod remover Smith. Exactly. Uh, Ricky, it's been a real pleasure having you here. Thanks for joining in on the show today. I appreciate you guys having me, man. And uh, I just want to give one more little shout out. If there's anybody um, that would like some personal one on one quarterback training, Make sure you give me a shout out at rfalldog14 at yahoo.com. Or you can look me up on my Facebook page. I do personal quarterback training also, all ages. Hey, I almost forgot to mention Chuck Gollop from one of the other shows here, Twin Cities Hip Show, was mentioning how uh, there used to be this car with the license plates foggy parked in the no parking zone in front of Bennigan's. It was actually. Uh, Solved That's what I thought it was. I thought yeah. it was. <laughs> Ricky. That was me. Ricky, that was you. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we had it clear. Me. Yep, we had her there. <laughs> That's a good thing. Let me repeat it again. rfogdog14 at yahoo.com, right, Ricky? Yes, sir. And I, and I can oh, attest to it. up on my Facebook page. Sounds good. And I can attest, I mean, Rick was around some of the kids when my kids were younger, and he is great with the kids. I mean, they listen to him. He's been there. He's played it. They listen. It's it's different than a dad coaching a game right. or something like right. that. They, got, they actually listen. You got the real coach there, man. That's good stuff. So, hey, good. I appreciate you guys having me on today, man. I appreciate it. Good luck on the golfing this season. Good luck on the 2015-2016 uh, season, uh, season with the Red Wing boys, too, my friend. Thank you very much. Hey, Tom, nice talking to you again, brother. Nice talking to you, buddy. We'll, we'll grab a beer soon. I was talking to Perkins, too. We'll have to get together. Sounds good. All right. All Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. See you later. Nice man. Rick's a great guy. I, you know, he's so – it was kind of hard for me sometimes to imagine him because he's so laid back. He's so easygoing. And it's like a lot of these guys that are athletes. I, I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to meet some guys. And as soon as you put him in a competitive situation, you just see him change. It's just, just total oh, change. Oh, the spark to him. comes in the eye. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But he has yep. got, I, I would sit there sometimes and go, you were so freaking laid back. <laughs> are you sure you played football? <laughs> Division <laughs> one football as a are quarterback? You sure? Are you sure? You were calling the play? Well, and if, if you saw him today and you saw pictures from back in the old days, mm. the man's grown a little. Okay. He's grown a little. All right. But now, I, and I now see you're Rick, letting it out. He's off the line. And, okay. I see, and I see Ricky at Lifetime once in a while. He, I mean, he does. He, he works out somehow, some way every day. He's big on cardio, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But he's not the skinny kid he was not you know, yeah, in sure. high school anymore. Sure. Um, and that's what's so funny. Like, when well, you saw Daryl the other day, Daryl scares me. Um, he is built but, but to Rick, this day. But Rick's still in great shape. Yeah. I mean, he's just a fantastic guy. And, and anybody that knows him, his positivity and his uh, – 
zest for life, I would yeah. use, just rubs off on you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you can't. You could you, feel that in our conversation. Yeah, you can't. You yeah. can't not be in a good mood if you're hanging out with Rick. Yeah, I could feel the smile in his voice as we're talking to him on the phone there. He's and uh, knowing on the competitive side, I kind of feel sorry for those kids in Red Wing. They're yeah. probably getting their butt kicked <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, you know, with the rebuilding and and having the coach there, that they they needed some of that. And look at that with the with the uh, Nick story off to the U of M. Exactly, so, uh, and, and I remember seeing that too. He was very very proud of that. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, we want to pick up on something that we uh, opened the door on. Last Last week on the show, the Mortgages and BS show with Tom Smith and yours truly, BT. Uh, rental properties, those property management companies, you know, I mean, whether you're going with a management company or not, you know, whether you're going to be a landlord on your own, some of the pitfalls, some of the things to look out for, some of the travails that can be a part of that experience. And that's what we wanted to dig into a little bit here. You know, and that's one of those things, it changed a lot after the crisis that we had to, you know, everybody differs on the years, but the 2006, 2007, 2008, thing. Eight, whatever. You know, you look at back then, it used to be one of those situations where anybody could be considered a landlord and you could count rental income and all that kind of stuff. And then they look at all the loans that went bad. And of course, it was a lot of these people that had these houses they were moving out of and they lost the house and that kind of thing. And they never performed as a landlord. So they've gotten stricter. Um, if a person doesn't have any history of being a landlord, you're not counting any rental income anymore. So what scares me is when you've got people that are like moving out of a house that want to move to another house. Yep. And they want to keep that house as a rental property. Yeah. They may not qualify for another loan because they're counting that mortgage payment against them. Against them, even exactly. though there's rental income coming. Even in. though there's rental income, um, what happens is there's they've gotten kind of strict on some of the guidelines in regards to down payments, cash reserves, things like that. Or you've or you've had a history of, of renting, but most cases what we're running into right now is somebody's got a house. They might be a little upside down on the equity, so yeah. they don't want to sell it, and they want to keep it as a rental property. Sure. Make sure you sit down and make sure you can qualify for what you want to buy before you do that. Otherwise, you may be renting yourself. Now, when it comes to taxes, I mean, obviously, you have to uh, report that earned income from rent. But what you're saying is when it comes to qualifying for another note, for another mortgage, that not necessarily that isn't necessarily going to slop over especially and be a part of that. Especially if it's the first property you got. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, okay. And, you know, another thing, now that I'm on a little tax, Jake, you're going to have two, you know, just thinking about expenses, you're going to have two property tax bills. You've got to keep that in mind. And uh, you well, once you, and once you turn that property into a rental, you lose that not you lose that homestead ability. It becomes yep. a, a non homestead property, and your taxes go up. Yep. And obviously, I mean, there, you know, everybody's situation is different. There's pros and cons to having rental property. There's some people that are fantastic at with the investment property stuff, but in most cases, what's happening right now is we're seeing, you know, average people like you and I, BT. We want to go buy another house. We don't have any equity, but we've got some money to put down the other house. And if we sell our house, we won't. So we say, hey, let's go rent it out. We'll go buy another property. And you find somebody to help manage it for you, and they charge you a fee, and they set it all up. You go to buy another property, and all of a sudden they go, oh, you know that $1,000 mortgage payment? We have to count the whole thing against you. So now you only qualify for this much else. Yeah, okay. And now you're not on, uh, that's that, not what I thought. Not, that's not a part of your income. Exactly. As, as it comes again to qualifying for that mortgage. Exactly. And that's why it's so important when anybody's looking at doing anything from a financial standpoint with buying a house or doing something with their real estate, make sure you know how it's going to affect you not just on that property, but on anything subsequently that you yeah. might want to do because it could come back to bite you in the butt. Well, and think about this, too, just some of the upfront costs. I mean, the capital costs of taking that, that homesteaded property and turning it into a rental. You suddenly have different things that you need to deal with, potential things that you might not have had to do when you were the resident living there. Ex uh, handrails. You know, you might have had a decent door on there, but it might not have been too secure. So now you've got to put a new door, new deadbolt in. You know, you just and start you, adding up some of these you, things. And you that's know? even if you have a management company. I mean, some people yeah, don't try to do it on exactly. their own. Exactly, yeah. But let's say you get a management company. And there's, there, I mean, and I, first of all, i got to say, they provide a great service. I mean, they really do. I understand what they do. I'm, I, I get it. But... They're taking care of this property for you. You're still going to incur the costs, but they're there to rent the property. Right. They're not, they don't really care about what your next transaction is going to be. They're caring about getting those rentals. So. Sure, and, the, and that's a good thing because that can be another huge expense if you're trying to do it on your own and fill that space. You can go vacant for a month, two, three, who knows what, and, uh, and that's just you know all that money out of your pocket right there. You're going to have to make that nut. And, of course, right now with the way the market is, I mean, everybody wants to rent because – you know, they're, they're building more and more apartments and more and more duplexes because there's not enough rental area out there because you still have people that lost their houses that are doing stuff. And a lot of the millennials have to rent because of the fact they can't find a house to buy. Yeah. So from the rental side of things, it's fantastic. But rent's also getting to the point that it's much more expensive to rent than it is to own a house than anymore. It, than it is to own, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we just need to get, you know, the, the sellers out there to sell their properties. We need to educate the buyers and say, hey, go buy a house because this is really a good time. I mean, when you look at rates where they're at in the four range and lower, 
you, you can't get that type yeah. of return on your money. Yeah, let's double back to those uh, to those uh, management companies because one thing that uh, that they probably do a really good job with is is uh, making sure that those potential tenants have been vetted better than maybe you could do on your own or would have the time maybe to do on your own there, as far as all the background checks that go into it, you know, past rental histories, paying on time, were they good or bad tenants in previous units, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of pathways. Very true. I mean, in, in, in most cases, I mean, they're doing almost like a mortgage. I mean, they're pulling a credit report, the yep. whole thing. They're making sure that you're getting, you know, somebody in there that's decent. Uh, depending upon the companies, are you know, you're probably not getting anybody with a felony or anything like that that yep. you have to risk on. Um, they want to make sure that they've got good people in there too because of the fact their reputation depends on what they do. And, again, they provide a great service, but, again, they're worried about getting that rental taken care of and not worried about what you're going to do next. Yeah, so they're going to want to fill it, which is a good thing. But, again, as Tom said, make sure you check out those finances, especially as it relates to what the next potential financial thing might be for you. And that next financial thing in this instance, we're talking about that next house you need to get Exactly. I mean, I just ran into it the other day. I had a borrower come in, sit down. They told me what they were doing. I said, you know, we have to count that whole payment against you. I saw the wife's face oh, just drop. Just, yeah, no kidding, huh? And I was like, but hold on, hold on. Yeah. Like, and, I, and I ran some quick numbers, and they still qualified. I okay. kind of had an idea they did based on what I was seeing. But she didn't know that. And this was a company. I mean, it's a bigger company in the area. And, but they didn't tell her that. Yeah. And I felt bad for her. And that's where, that's where you know, our job is to educate. And I hope these guys start picking that up, too, and yeah. can educate these people on what could happen if they rental single. Even though there's an offset from the rent to the mortgage payment, it's still, it's not going to work in your exactly. advantage. So you got to keep an eye on that. All right. Uh, the Federal uh, Open Market Committee, the guys, they, they set all the mon- monetary policy. Uh, you know, the governors and then some of the presidents on the on the Fed, they get together. What what happened with this latest round with the FOMC meeting? Yeah, they met this week. They always meet every month for a couple of days, and then they announce what they think their policy is going to be going forward. They came out basically saying, we're holding pat. We're not going to do anything with interest rates. Yeah. We're looking for a certain inflation gauge. We're not there. Uh, bond markets like it. Uh, rates are still low. Um of course, every time something negative happens to the economy, they, everybody freaks out and they think they're going to raise the rates right away. But I always say when you're in a 50-foot hole and you still have 45 feet to go, it's not time to get excited yet. <laughs> but these bond <laughs> traders deal with billions and billions right. of dollars, right? So, I right. mean, they're, they're, they get a little more freaked out about it. The other issue that we've been watching, too, is this turmoil in Greece with their economy, if they're going to default or not or get aid. So that's been affecting us as well on our side in regards to where people are investing their money. But the long-term forecast, at least through the end of this year and going in the first quarter of next year, is – Rates should stay under 5%, God, which is... See, there you go. I mean, I've been doing this a lot of years. That's just unbelievable because this has been... We're running almost on two and a half years now where we've been under four. Under four. Yeah. yeah. So if we make it in the next year, that'll be an over a three-year period of time where we've seen rates where this is at. And that's wow. just unbelievable. Yeah, it is phenomenal. Well, and as we were talking about just a minute ago, you know, the rental you know, versus buying perspective, uh, you know, I see rents and we're seeing you know, 12, 11, 11, 12, 13, 16, 1,800 bucks a month. And, and uh, given that you've got the you know, decent enough credit and it doesn't have to be perfect, as we've talked about before, decent enough credit and uh, you know, some good history in terms of payments and things like that. Uh, you know, you're you're going to be able to find a house, a decent place to live for less than that. And it's hard, you know, it's hard to really sit and say, here's what it takes to buy a house, BT, because every situation is different. Right. But I can tell you right now, it's possible to buy a house even with a credit score as low as 580 if you meet certain guidelines. And that's very unusual. Most lenders go down to about 640. I can actually get it down to about 580. But again, it's, the borrower's got to meet certain guidelines yep. in there. So it's still very possible to buy a house even if you had some rough issues. And you know what? There's only one way to find out. Talk to a loan officer. There you go. Get in there and talk to a guy like Tom Smith. Uh, throw, your, throw your email out there again, brother. Uh, my work email is yep. tom.smith at amic, A-M-E-C-I-N-C dot org. All right. Very good. Uh, props to you and your guest appearance on the Twin Cities hit show just the other day here on the Alive and Social Network with Rusty, with Miss Shannon, and with Chuck. And I'm throwing some additional props out to you in this regard. Your call on the show, pop culture as it were, in regard to Cousin It, as you like to call him, <laughs> on, on a show that, that you've been watching a little more so. I, I kind of covered the NBC's The Voice a little more on the front end of the season, but you've been kind of pinging in there a little more on the backside. It's a good show. I like that show I like show the show. You know, and, and you know, my wife likes it, and my daughters like it, so, of course, Dad has to like it. And I, like, I guess i got to say I like chick shows sometimes as they go, but there's some things I can't watch, like Fifty Shades of Grey. But um, we got down to the end, and they asked me who I thought would win the other day, and I, I liked that Megan that was on there. She was older. Megan lady. was good, yeah. And then Sawyer, who was the young kid, and yeah, I call him Cousin Hit because he's got that long, straight hair. 
Um, and I picked him, <laughs> and he won. He takes home the big kahuna. Now, I didn't win anything out of it except bragging rights, but hey, I thought that was pretty cool. And then I picked the right bachelorette, too, so that was kind of cool. The, you got the bachelorette thing going and the voice thing going. Do you have any other prognostications? Oh, Tom Smith for pop culture coming up here in the not-too-distant future. Rates are good, and if you're a first-time buyer, get a hold of me. That's what it's all about on the Mortgages and BS Show. Thanks again to Ricky Foggy for joining in on the program. I really appreciate that from Foggy. That was a great, guy, great, great conversation. He's a, like I said, he's a great guy. Awesome guy. We'll, we'll catch up with you next week on the Mortgages and BS Show with yours truly, BT. And Tom. Here on the Alive and Social Network. See you then. Oh, my neck. <laughs>